If everyone has taken their seat. Now that our dinner has nourished our stomachs, I'm delighted to say that at this juncture in our program, we have a treat to sustain and nourish our minds. George Orwell once said, the further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. Sadly, today our information space is increasingly being polluted by the noise of conspiracies and disinformation. Facts and accuracy, once the sacred pillars of responsible journalists and editors, have been displaced by self-appointed social media vigilantes and anti-democratic foreign actors. Now more than ever, books and the writers that produce them have a vital role to play in protecting truth, facts, and our democratic society. That's why we are thrilled to welcome our next guest. With over 240,000 followers on Twitter, US-born Canadian journalist Diane Francis calls herself an anti-stupidity activist. And whether you read her syndicated column in Canada's Post Media or her articles in the New York Post and Huffington Post, or you follow her Twitter feed or her newsletter on Substack, you will appreciate her brilliant, analytical, no-nonsense writing which tackles everything from the future trends in technology to geopolitics, U.S.-Canada relations, finance, Russia, Ukraine, energy policy, ethics, and corruption. She is editor-at-large for the National Post newspaper, a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C., specializing in Eurasia, distinguished professor at Ryerson University's Ted Rogers School of Management, faculty member with Singularity University in Mountain View, California, a visiting fellow at Harvard University's Shorenstein Center, a media fellow at the World Economic Forum, columnist at the Financial Post, board member of the Hudson Institute Kleptocracy Initiative, and the Canada-US Law Institute Case University Law School Cleveland, and she is the author of 10 books. Her unique insight has made her a sought after speaker at various forums. So we are truly privileged to have her with us here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome award winning journalist and best selling author, Diane Francis. That was a heck of an introduction. Thank you. Um, I've had a bit of red wine, so just telling you that ahead. Um, I'm not going to go off the rails, but uh, I may ramble a bit. I really welcome the chance to do this. I did not ever hear of Stanley Peterson. God bless him. What a guy. That's amazing. He's done something really important, and you're doing something really important on his behalf. So I think that's, that's, that's great. Got a party going on out there. <laughs> it's okay, never stop. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna do a little bit of uh, personal history here because my narrative is totally incorporated into Ukraine's narrative. I'm not Ukrainian. I did an Ancestry.com test <laughs> and discovered I was 12% from that region. And I think I know who it was. It was a great grandfather. 
who never, you know, said where he was from because you just didn't do that, I guess, if you were concerned about it. Uh, so that's, that's, that's sort of the genetic connection, if I can say. Uh, my other connection tonight is that I have grown up in a house of books. Parents that were readers who valued literature, wrote letters to the editor, faithfully read, we read four newspapers a day in Chicago where I grew up. Why did we read four newspapers a day? Because they all fought with each other and it was a town full of scandal and corruption and politics. So that's what I grew up with. I grew up in the world of literature and journalism. I wanted to be a novelist. I'm glad I didn't. Some people think I write fiction, <laughs> but I don't. But the important thing is literature and journalism are extremely important to civilization. And I don't want to compare them equally. Literature is on a higher plane, but journalism is also important to civilization. And that doesn't mean anybody or anything that calls itself journalistic. What I mean by journalism is reporting, witness, transparency, accuracy, courage. That's what journalism is to me. I didn't get into journalism until I immigrated to Canada with a draft dodger husband. And we started a business and had a couple of kids and I got involved in local politics and I got involved to a certain extent in controversy, which seems to follow me or I follow it. And so I was offered a job at a local newspaper in Brampton and they offered me the job of being a reporter, general reporter. So I did police, courts, cops, I did features, I did humor, I covered speeches, the whole thing. And you know, you find out very quickly when you're writing things for public consumption that you have to be very careful about what you do, that people lobby you to get into the paper, to tell lies if they can convince you, or to mislead you, or to cover up, and so on. So I always reverted to the moral compass that I learned in Chicago, where I grew up. And there was a very famous journalist called H.L. Mencken. And he is my, his statement about what journalism should be is mine. Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That's the deal. Got to do both. And so I've always tried to do that. I haven't always succeeded. But that's been my sort of moral compass. But it's challenging. It's always been challenging to be a journalist. You have a boss telling you, don't write that because of the advertiser. Don't write that because of the mayor of the town. Don't write that because we're going to get sued, and so on and so forth. So you just have to navigate yourself through those shoals. It's challenging. And today is no different. Should have been better, but it isn't. So we face grave challenges, those of us who write for the public. Uh, for Ukrainians, obviously the number one problem is Russia. No question. But there are problems everywhere. There are ubiquitous universal problems that plague every society, even so-called dem democratic free societies. There are, in every society, malign forces. I'm talking about cartels, mafia, criminals, bad actors who will do whatever they can to prevent information that they don't like getting in or to push into the public sphere information they benefit from. There's, of course, disinformation and propaganda. Not just Russia, not just China, but the Republican and Democratic parties, the liberal NDP and conservative parties. This goes on, and you have to navigate through it and understand it, and it can defeat you and destroy you. The other big 
problem is superstition and ignorance. Certain things you just can't write about because it's just not understood. Or you have to write about it repeatedly and emphasize it in order, to, in order for it to be finally comprehended. The other big problem, of course, around the world, particularly Ukraine, but not just Ukraine, is state capture. And I would submit that CBC is state capture in Canada. Do you ever see things? I'm not trying to make it morally equivalent to what Putin does, but do you ever see or hear things or listen to pundits on the channel we pay for that has anything to do other than the party line? We're very, very sensitive to these things in the word business. There's also elite and social censorship. There's religious censorship. There's political correctness. And there's political pressure. And that goes on in every society. It's a matter of degree. And it's a matter of whether the media ownership is splintered and independent enough and strong enough and competitive enough to be able to withstand all of those things, from the malign forces, to the Russian propaganda, to the superstition, to the state capture, to the religious uh, biases, and so on and so forth. And then on top of all of that, which has always been there, is the, the problem of social media. Social media runs a race with us for eyeballs, audience, advertising dollars, talent, without having the requirement to be liable for damages they do to people, or to curate for factuality whatever they allow to be posted, not just by anybody on their, or advertisers or other people on their site. So lots has been written about that. I think things, I think regulations, are going to eventually come because, by the way, the newspapers of the day at the turn of the century in the United States, in Chicago, New York, or wherever, were wild, were wide open. They said anything they wanted about anybody. You could buy a newspaper to destroy someone's political career. So let's not be naive about this. This is a human problem. This is a problem of power. I've been lucky enough, I'm self-taught. I decided to become a journalist, as I say, about 28 years old. I had two little kids. I got involved in politics. I thought, hey, this is fun. I can write pretty well. I want to make a difference. And then I got a job with a small newspaper in Brampton, Ontario. And ever since, I've been able to work for publications that have sent me all over the world covering interesting people, amazing events, which brings me to Ukraine. And it's all Bob Anishuk's fault. <laughs> Apart from the fact I had a great grandfather who was Ukrainian I didn't know about, but Bob and I became friends. He was a big time, you know, Bay Street lawyer, and I was a business writer with the Toronto Star, then the Financial Post. And so Bob and I would find ourselves at conferences and dinners and and he'd have clients that he introduced me to and so on. But Bob always, always was very passionate about Ukraine, about what was going on, what was happening, educationally oriented. Did you know about this? Did you know about that? Now, add to that the fact is that when I immigrated from the United States, I came from Chicago to Toronto, there was a lot of, you know, Ukrainian, there were a lot of Poles in Chicago, but not necessarily a lot of Ukraine. I certainly didn't have friends as a kid and in the neighborhood with folks from the Slavic nations, but Canada, holy cow. So I go to Toronto, and all my new friends, as a new immigrant, my husband and I, as a new immigrant, you know, you hang out with other people that are outsiders who really can't break in, and we're just down there and everything else. We were in the graphic arts industry. We were self-employed. There were Poles. There were Ukes. They were all kinds of people, but they weren't, you know, wasps. They weren't Rosedale, because we weren't there. 
we, we weren't entitled to be there. So I got to know their stories, because I'm a storyteller and I want to soak up the stories and the narratives. And I learned about the, the, the hideous stories of, of how their families came to come to Canada, what they went through, and so on. I mean, I was a student of history, but there's nothing like hearing it firsthand. So by 1992, I'm a very prominent journalist. I'm working for the Toronto Sun, the Financial Post, McLean's Magazine, the big chain, and they're about to dismantle the Soviet Union. And my publisher, Doug Creighton, who was a great journalist, said to me, I want you to go on February 1, 1992, to the Soviet Union for eight, 10 weeks with a photographer and tell us what's going on. This is the biggest shift in history ever. And I want you to do that. So I called Bob and I said, hey, I knew there was a ready audience of Ukrainians. So I said, first stop, Ukraine. So my first stop was Ukraine. And the photographer and I went, and Bob set up meetings with the new president, Kravchuk, who was charming, good looking. He was the guy who did it. He did it. He did it. He was a Western Ukrainian. He pulled it off. And I remember talking years later to a, an advisor, a former advisor, Ilyanov. Ilyanarov, uh, who was an advisor to Putin, and I said, what did you think, why did the Ukraine, why was it allowed to leave? And he said, oh, well, everybody knew. Yeltsin appointed a Western Ukrainian? It was over. Your deputy was always from the East and always Russian. So that was an interesting little anecdote. But I went there and I interviewed Kravchuk. Bob would be the translator, it was amazing, it was an un incredible experience to see a country trying to make the transition. And of course it was doomed. Didn't know it at the time. Bob, I came back and I said, Bob, oh, let's, start a, let's start a chamber of commerce, a Canadian-Ukrainian chamber. So we did, we became founders and we tried our best and we still do. And I just thought it was like, gee whiz, let's have a bake sale, you know? Let's do her. They're nice folks. Let's make this work. Well, we know. So I've been back about 15 times professionally as a journalist. Maybe a bit of a record for a North American journalist. Mr. Kravchuk was lovely, charming, I think a good guy. But they didn't understand, I think, that they really needed to glom on to the, Ukraine, the, the European Union as quickly as they could. Instead, they decided to steer their own path, didn't want to do that. And the difference is Poland has a living standard 10 times better than Ukraine's. Ukraine struggled to try and reinvent a wheel, didn't know what to do. Am I popping or? Um, didn't know what to do. Didn't realize it should have joined, you know, a path to membership as the satellites did. Should, didn't realize a lot of things. And I remember I was with Bob Anishuk in the gallery of the Rada one night when the debate was heated about giving up the nuclear weapons. We were there. Don't think I really comprehended the importance of that. Bob, I think, did. And then we met and huddled with various groups trying to decide, oh my god, let's do this. And Clinton was putting pressure like crazy on Ukraine and Kazakhstan and Belarus. And we all know how that turned out. It's what we have now. That's what happened. I'm not sure they could have sustained their, their nuclearization, the cost structure, and so on, but the Budapest Memorandum was signed, completely ignored by Britain, the United States, Russia, and, and we have what we have. So, been there through the whole thing. It's interesting then, 
took a turn. In about 95, 96, Bob and I were approached by a, a Ukrainian entrepreneur. There's lots of them. Ukrainians are amazing. And, and said, we'd like to start a newspaper. You're, you're a, a editor of a financial newspaper? Yes, I am. And, and you know, can you help us? Uh, I said, sure. And Bob said, yeah, let's do it. So Bob actually flew to London because I was part of the Financial Times Pearson Group media empire. They owned the Financial Post at the time in Canada. And they agreed, and what would he, I couldn't go, but he went there and I introduced him, and he negotiated a deal which the Financial Times never gave before or since, which was to give the complete feed of all the stock market and bond quotes on a regular basis to this new little newspaper in Kyiv called Finance. And that, of course, was the backbone of starting a newspaper, it was a financial newspaper. Journalists were hired, and our publisher got office space and everything else. I'm not sure exactly the timeline, but probably eight months later, I got a call, as Bob did, from our publisher, and he said they just came into the newsroom with baseball bats and nearly beat the editor to death in front of everybody. Everybody's left. They've taken the presses. It's over. We couldn't do anything from a distance. You know, he begged us to try, you know, get his, him and his kids out. I think he fled. I don't know what happened. I think Bob saw him later. He survived okay, but that was Ukraine under Kuchma. Kuchma was a monster. Kuchma's brother-in-law was in the inner circle of Yeltsin's government. He was a red director for Russia. Kuchma is, has been the problem for Ukraine. And then, of course, he shows up negotiating Minsk on behalf of Ukraine, which is a terrible document. So frankly, after that happened, and then journalists started to disappear under Kuchma. Disappear. Gungardza was found beheaded prominent television journalist. And I said, you know what? I'm out of here. I'm not going there for a while. So I didn't. And then what brought me back was the Orange Revolution, which was exciting and important. And of course, the significance of the Orange and the dig uh, revolutions of dignity in Ukraine is that you, ha you probably, as Ukrainians, don't understand. The Ukraine has the only civil society of any scale that could have and did stand up to the Soviet system who was part of the Soviet system. Cossacks didn't. Nobody else did. Belarusians didn't. And so hit the streets, overthrew the election of Yanukovych, only to get that bugger back again through slippage, through the incompetence of Yashchenko and Tymoshenko and corruption and all the rest of it. Now we're at 2014. It's an amazing historical event. Again, civil society rises up and says, we don't want to join them. We want to be Western. And this is what we're going to do. Withstands the force, withstands the whole thing, and pulls it off. But the most amazing thing that happened was after Yanukovych fled. And, and that was, and I liken it to the importance of the Dunkirk evacuation, that a whole group of people, 6,000 soldiers is all they were left with. I mean, Yanukovych decimated the Ukrainian military to make way for the, the, the invasion. But when the invasion started, you know, I mean, housewives, nurses, IT guys did crowdfunding to raise money to repair old tanks. It was unbelievable. They stopped the second biggest military the world has ever known in history, where they stopped it. That's something to be proud of. It's too bad it had to happen, but it's amazing.
I'll do it again. Because Ukrainians know who they are. And they're going to defend it. And so, you know, w another wonderful interview I had as a reporter was in 2015 with a young guy who had a nickname, Mally, and he had joined a militia. He was 15 years old when I interviewed him in a Kiev hospital bed in August 2015. It's a year after the invasion. And I said, what's your story? And he said, I watched the revolution in Kiev on television, and then I saw the Russians invade my country. He said, I went to my grandfather and said, can I have your hunting rifle? And then he went to his mother and said, I'm going to the front. And she said, you have to protect yourself. Let me buy you a piece of brass. And they taped it to his chest. And he took the train. And he served in a militia. And this was not unusual. This is incredible. These are incredible stories. And that's the heroism and the courage of Ukraine. So where are we now? Where are we now? The Minsk Protocol is going to be shoved down people's throats, shouldn't be. Kuchma negotiated it. That's enough for me to reject. They want, the Russians want, Donbass to be paid for and governed by Ukraine, but will be controlled and a Trojan horse inside the Ukrainian parliament. Not on, no. Shouldn't be allowed, should be rejected. And that's what it's going to be about in the, in the next little while. We know that Ukraine has spent 7% of its GDP, more than any five European countries put together, NATO members put together, on rebuilding a military that was second to none before the revolution, the independence, 400,000 combat troops, very motivated, the country is more united than ever in the face of Putin and his threats. It is Europeanized more than ever before. Poles are now saying, we want to join NATO. Whether that happens or not, it doesn't matter. They're a de facto member of NATO. I mean, they're pouring weapons in there. And they will continue to do so, as well as advisors. And Ukrainians have done what Ukrainians do. They've gotten on with it. I mean, I've spent a lot of time there, and as a business writer, I started to realize how incredibly, well, as, as a Canadian with a lot of Ukrainian friends, I realized how Ukrainians punch way above their weight in everything, science, business, entrepreneurship. And, and that is exactly what Ukrainians have done in that country. Then I realized, talking to, I did some business. I became, I started to develop some software some, with some Ukrainian partners in Lviv and, and in Kyiv, and, and one of whom is now a member of parliament uh, in the Rada. But they were my partners, and I realized how smart they were. And I couldn't get over it until, you know, I talked to some of them, and I realized that the Silicon Valley of the USSR was Ukraine. It was nowhere else. The engineering, the biomed, the tech, the IT, it was Ukrainian brain power. Well, no wonder he doesn't want to see it leave. And it was so obvious to me. You know, there's right now, there's four unicorns. You know what a unicorn is? A startup company within three years worth a billion bucks out of Ukraine. Grammarly, I mean, you just go through the list. Gigantic brain power. And the minute visas were allowed for Ukrainians into Europe, there's like five million Ukrainians working there now, sending remittances back home. People building houses for their grandparents and buying sheep and little farmland and whatever. This is the talented part of the USSR, the only talented part, in my opinion. So where, where are we now? Where, where we are now? We are now, the bully is getting desperate. 
And that's not a good thing. But Putin's behavior has united Europe to the extent Europe can be united. It's united the US Congress towards sanctions. And, and I want to also say something that, as a journalist, may not mean that much to you, but is very significant. Five years ago, nobody knew where Ukraine was, how to spell it, and how big it was. OK? They do now. Thank you, Vlad. <laughs> and frankly, I know I, I don't have the same emotional attachment to Ukraine as everybody else in this room, but I want to tell you, and I don't have a crystal ball. I'm confident it's all going to be fine, because Ukrainians don't stop being Ukrainians. And Putin is not going to last forever. So on that note, it's been an honor to be invited tonight. I think Mr. Peterson is an amazing human being. And I think Lisa's done a great job. And I think you're all here in honor of a very important cause. Thank you.